time to most of us is represented by the ticking of a clock. We understand the length of an hour, a day, and perhaps even a year because we have experienced their passing. But most people have trouble with time in the geological sense. We view the earth as unchanging. Mountains and valleys appear the same to men now as they did a year or 50 years ago. Geologists tell us that the Earth's history goes back thousands of millions of years. We find such spans of time hard to comprehend, but we tend to accept the geologists' interpretation of the story in the rocks. But to people living in the 16 or 1700s, the idea of an Earth whose history stretched back even a million years was radical and unbelievable. In 1654, an archbishop in Ireland named James Usher calculated the age of the Earth and announced that it had been created at 9 o'clock on the morning of October 26th in the year 4004 BC. Most scholars and clerics working in the Middle Ages regarded the Earth as the center of the universe and thought that it had been designed as a home for man. Such a recently formed planet, created expressly for our use, was a very comfortable idea. It was much more believable than the idea of an insignificant planet orbiting an average star with a life history measured in billions of years. So it is understandable that the first geologic theories met with a great deal of resistance. People countered these ideas by proposing that the Earth had been created by a series of catastrophes and that fossils were simply accidents in the rocks. As late as the early years of this century, some people still argued that geologic formations like these had been created to test the faithful. But the first light that was shed on the history of our planet came when James Hutton proposed that the forces which had shaped the Earth had operated uniformly over long periods of time. Hutton, who was trained as a doctor of medicine, was a gentleman farmer. He had become interested in geology as he introduced scientific methods into his farming. His letters tell of observations of erosion on his farm, volcanic rocks seen on walks near Edinburgh, and layers of pebbles which he found he could trace across the countryside. But Hutton did more than simply look at the rocks. He connected them to the processes that were responsible for their formation and concluded that the processes he saw at work in the Scottish countryside could be used to explain the features he found in the rocks. Hutton's work might have gone unrecognized because his style of writing was difficult and involved. If his friend John Playfair hadn't written a small, easily read book which explained his ideas. Later, Charles Lyell used many examples of his theories and concluded in his Principles of Geology that no causes whatever have changed the earth, except those that still do so under the eyes of man. Geologists began to look at the earth from a different point of view, one that pictured a long history during which the processes we have studied were shaping and molding our planet. If we are to study the history of a planet as old as the Earth, we need some kind of time scale. The time scale geologists use is a relative ordering of events that begins with the formation of the Earth and comes forward in sequence to the present. This white layer is assigned an age younger than the rocks below it and older than these red ones above it, 
so the layer is dated relative to the surrounding layer. Until the early years of this century, geologists lacked the tools to date rocks or events absolutely. Instead, they had to rely on relative time scales. The tools geologists use to deduce the relative sequence of events from the rocks in an area are amazingly simple. They amount to a series of rules. Each rule describes the way rocks record the history of their formation. The most basic rule is that of superposition. It simply says that in a series of layers like these, the older rocks are on the bottom and the younger on top. If we begin at the oldest rocks here and move upward, we also move closer to the present because each succeeding bed was deposited on the one beneath it and is therefore younger. Geologists use several other rules to help them determine the history of the Earth. Sedimentary rocks are laid down one layer at a time, and some kinds of rocks are laid down only under certain conditions. These shales, for instance, could only be the result of slow-moving streams depositing layer upon layer of mud in a shallow, swampy environment. This fossil turtle shell confirms another rule. The rule says that fossils in a layer may indicate the time of deposition as well as the conditions and climate. So this fossil in the Badlands confirms that this area was once a swamp. It may also help to date the layer more exactly if this particular fossil meets the necessary conditions to serve as an index fossil. If an index fossil is found in several locations, geologists can place the rocks containing the fossils in their relative position in the geologic timetable. In practice, the geologist tries to use several such fossils, along with other features such as similar sequences of beds, to add reliability to his conclusions. Unhappily, there are a few places around the world where layers of sediment are piled on top of one another without interruptions or complications. Many events can leave their mark in the sediments. Here in the Grand Canyon, for example, this irregular surface marks a period when erosion replaced deposition as a dominant process. The surface of the dark colored metamorphic rock was carved by erosion over a long period of time. The next layer was then deposited on top of the eroded surface, and there is no evidence of any other disturbance. So this break in the sedimentary record is called an erosional unconformity. Another type of break is an angular unconformity like this one. Here the erosional break also involved folding, which tilted the older layers. Later, after some of the tilted layers were eroded, the overlying layers were deposited on the folded and eroded surface. The events which folded these layers must be more recent than the youngest layer in the sequence. This fault must also be younger than the youngest layer it has broken. This igneous intrusion is younger than the rocks through which it cut. And these layers must have been deposited before they were folded and metamorphosed into slate. Each event is a key the geologist can use to unravel the puzzle and derive a relative age for the deposits in the geologic column. William Smith was a canal builder who lived in England in the late 1700s. He discovered that layers of rock could be traced across country by matching fossils and sequences of layers from one locality to another, and he was able to assign relative ages to each of the series of layers. The detective work required to construct the first geologic time scale was amazing. Geologists subdivided the rocks based on natural features and used the punctuation marks of events recorded in the rocks to divide the time scale. As a result, the geologic time scale we use today 
is divided into major divisions on the basis of events like the raising of mountain ranges or the appearance of the reptiles. The major divisions in the geologic time scale are called eras. The first two are shown in red and are called the Archaeozoic and Proterozoic eras. The Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic eras are named for ancient, middle, and recent life and contain most of the plant and animal record. An animal record. The eras are divided into smaller units called periods on the basis of less widespread events like the raising of mountains or the appearance of groups of animals or plants. The Paleozoic begins with a period called the Cambrian and includes other periods called the Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and Permian, followed by the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods which make up the Mesozoic era. The Cenozoic is the shortest era and because the rocks were formed recently, the record is much more complete than in earlier eras. As a result, the tertiary and quaternary periods which make up this era have been further subdivided into still smaller units called epochs. So the geologic timetable is broken into long spans called eras which in turn are divided into periods and epochs. While stratigraphers were at work putting together a relative time scale, other geologists searched for ways to place absolute dates on the events in that scale. In 1899, an English geologist named Salus estimated the age of the earth by adding up the total thickness of measured sediments and dividing by the present rate at which sediments are being formed. But his estimate was not very exact. Other geologists tried to estimate time based on their estimates of the rate at which erosion carved the land, but that was found to vary widely. Erosion has been very rapid in the soft sediments of Bryce Canyon, lowering the surface at a rapid rate and producing unusual shapes and forms. But in other locations like this sandstone butte north of Yellowstone, erosion has proceeded at a much slower pace. So erosion was of little use as a measure of time. Irish scientist named John Jolly calculated the age of the oceans based on their saltiness. He believed that the oceans were originally fresh water and he knew that salt was washed into the sea by rivers as they carried material eroded from the land. Using this information plus a rough calculation of the volume of all the oceans, he suggested the age of the earth to be about 100 million years. Other workers discovered more accurate methods. By coring living trees and counting the growth rings, they were able to work backward in time. They found they could use the growth rings of ancient trees buried in the sediments to trace events backward into prehistoric time. But they were only capable of reaching a short way back into the geologic past. Thin layers of clay deposited on lake bottoms during glacial periods in the northern United States tell of climatic changes as much as 100,000 years ago. But none of the methods we have just considered spans the great stretch of time necessary to read the geologic record. The discovery that was to change our picture of the Earth's age seemed at first to have very little to do with geology. At the turn of the century, physicists discovered that radioactive elements like uranium were giving off particles at a regular rate and in the process were changing to other elements. In this laboratory, 
Dr. Paul Fulliger is using the principles of radioactive decay to determine how long ago the rocks in a sample were formed. He begins by dissolving the rock sample in sulfuric or nitric acid. Then he uses these columns to separate the elements he wishes to measure. With the elements separated, he can analyze the sample in the mass spectrograph. The instrument will measure the amount of the original radioactive mineral remaining in the sample and the amounts of the elements produced when the original mineral decayed. The mass spectrograph heats the sample until atoms of the element become electrically charged. The charged atoms are guided between the poles of a large electromagnet. The heavier a particle is, the more its path of travel will be changed by the magnetic field. So the various charged particles strike different points on this detector and are counted. Once the amounts of the various elements in a sample are known, Dr. Fulliger can use the rate of decay, called its half-life, to calculate the age of the sample. Not all minerals contain elements that can be used to date the rocks. Some uranium minerals decay to lead with a half-life of about 4.5 billion years. So those minerals are quite useful in dating very old rocks. But they're not so useful for dating younger rocks because the ratio of uranium to lead gets so small that it's very difficult to measure. However, some igneous rocks, like this granite, contain the element potassium, which decays to the gas argon with a half-life of about 1.3 billion years. The potassium-argon decay series is often used to date rocks because its relatively short half-life allows a dating of much younger rocks. Another advantage comes from the fact that gaseous argon can escape from molten rocks but not from solid ones. So the gas present in the rock must have formed by decay after the rock cooled and became solid. And the date of its cooling is therefore more reliable. The radioactive decay of other elements have particular value for certain kinds of work. Archaeologists use carbon-14, which decays very rapidly and is incorporated into all living tissue. Its half-life of 5,700 years has made it particularly valuable because it can be used to date old logs and remnants of bone and plant material in early man's long-abandoned villages. In this stadium, we can compare the Earth's history to a familiar scale. But the total of geologic time is so great that in order to understand its size, we have divided it into two parts. This goal line divides the two parts and represents a point in time about 600 million years ago. Out beyond this goal line is most of geologic history including the Archeozoic and Proterozoic eras, which take up more than 4,000 million years. To reach a point that far back in time, we would have to leave this goal line and add more than seven and a half football fields to our scale. The oldest rocks on our planet are not part of the Earth, but come from space. Samples taken from meteor craters around the world have all been dated at about 4,600 million years. Recently, rocks from the moon gave the same date. So our solar system appears to be about 4.6 billion years old. The oldest known rocks formed on the Earth were found in Western Greenland. They have been dated at about 3,900 million years. On our time scale, these rocks would still be about seven and a half football fields from the goal line. 
if we were walking toward the goal, we would encounter the first evidence of life as we crossed the sixth goal line. These fossils of microorganisms are about 3,200 million years old. And about 200 meters from the goal line, we would begin seeing the first fossil algae colonies, jellyfish, worms, and other soft-bodied creatures. Then as we finally reach this goal line, separating the Precambrian from the Paleozoic, the first animals with skeletons would appear. From here on, the fossil record is much more complete. In the Grand Canyon, this boundary is marked by an obvious angular unconformity and numerous dates from around the world give an average of about 600 million years. Now we can begin walking through the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic eras, toward the present at the other end of the field. The Paleozoic saw many events. During the Ordovician period, the primitive jawless fish appeared. And during the next two periods, the Silurian and the Devonian, they developed into many diverse kinds of animals, including sharks, bony fish, snakes, and other early reptiles. During the Carboniferous period, lush swamps flourished in the eastern United States. Today, those coal swamps furnish most of our oil, coal, and gas resources. And here, the Permian period begins. The Permian saw the rise of the first mammal and the beginning of a mountain building event that raised the Appalachians and brought the Paleozoic era to a close. Here, about 230 million years ago, is the beginning of the Mesozoic era, which is also known as the Age of Reptiles. During this time, the dinosaurs appeared, became the dominant form of life, and then suddenly disappeared. Today, only snakes, lizards, turtles, birds, and crocodiles remain. Then about 70 million years ago, as the Mesozoic era came to a close, the Rocky Mountains were raised, while at the same time, Europe and Africa split away from North America, forming today's Atlantic Ocean. This final era, the Cenozoic, saw the mammals expand to become the dominant form of life on Earth. And finally, about a million or so years ago, man appeared. In this last 15 centimeters, glaciers advanced and retreated across our continent. Our civilization has lasted 5,000 years. It stretches less than one ten thousandth of a millimeter, a span so small on our scale that we would need a microscope to see it. Geologic time covers a span so great that it is almost impossible to grasp its size or scope. Yet it is the time scale of life's development. It is the framework on which the Earth's history is written. And most important of all, it goes on from here.